Okay, good, 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 good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Tao De Jing. Uh, we are going today. We are going to start from fifty eight and uh, going to fifty nine and probably go to sixty. I'm not sure. And the format is uh, everyone can read your own favorite uh, translation. And then after that, Amang and I are going to present our translation and then we can discuss. And for the first two hours, we discuss, uh, focus on the chapter. And after two hours, when Shirin Khan is here, uh, we can discuss a little bit more uh, uh, general question, like what is Tao and what do you understand about Tao and how does Tao apply it to your life or in general? Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's start it. Uh, we start from Huang, please. Okay, translation by Professor Moss Roberts, stanza 58. On the room restrained but caring, simple and wholesome stay the room. But on the room that probes and prods, they connive and they contrive. Good fortune stands beside ill fate, Beneath good fortune, ill fate hides. Who can find a turning point? For it, there is no standard rule. Rule reverses no to exception. Boon reverses to affliction. For which men have lost direction for a time of long duration. This is why the wise who rule keep to the square but form no edge, gather gains, but would not thrust, stay straight and true, but cross no line, and shed light, but not to blind. Thank you, Kwan. Uh, anyone want to read your version? No? Oh, Joe, please. Yeah, mine was, boy, there's so many different versions. This was quite different. So this is Derek Lynn. When governing is lackluster, the people are simple and honest. When governing is scrutinizing, the people are shrewd and crafty. Misfortune is what fortune depends upon. Fortune is where misfortune hides beneath. Who knows their ultimate end? They have no determined outcome. Rightness reverts to become strange. Goodness reverts to become wicked. The confusion of people has lasted many long days. Therefore, the sages are righteous without being scathing, incorruptible without being piercing, straightforward without being ruthless, illuminated without being flashy. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Okay, so no more? Okay, so uh, before we start, uh, can, can, can you read the first two lines on the version you, you are reading? Yeah, sure. On the room restrained but caring, <laughs> Simple and wholesome stay the road. And the, the next two, please. Yeah. But on the road that probes and prods, oh. they con they connive and they contrive. Okay, got you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Chapter fifty eight. Yeah, just just one minute. Let me bring up the text. Um. Okay, here, right? So, yeah, I'm on. Please. Chapter 58, Government of Probing. If the government is silent, the people will be honest. If the government is probing, the people will feel lacking. Misfortune is what fortune leans on. Fortune is what misfortune hides under. 
Who knows which way, fortune or misfortune, it goes. There is no proper expectation, nor what is expected may become what is unexpected. Oddity. The good may become evil. People are perplexed for a long time. For this reason, the sage is squared, principled, yet not cutting, critical, irreproachable, yet not unforgiving, not hurting people, straightforward, yet not unbridled, bright, yet not lazy. Yeah, thank you, Amam. Um, I think this one is uh, use a lot of Chinese word is contrast each other. So uh, at beginning, uh, the text said men men. Okay, if you look at the word closely, you may see a door and the heart inside, which I translate as silent. It's not going out, and which is opposite to cha cha. Okay, which means probing. Okay, so you are going outside to check this kind of thing. So if you stay calm, quiet, I mean government, then people will be chun chun, that's the word, means honest or plain, okay? And if you do a lot of things, probing, scrutinizing, uh, checking, people will feel decking, which is a chue chue, that means deck something. That's the first teaching about uh, uh, government. And then the interesting is he talk about fortune and the misfortune. Okay, fortune, misfortune. It, the fortune can become misfortune. Misfortune can become fortune. Okay, and we all have this kind of experience. Something you see is good, but turn out is bad. Some sign or some situation you see is bad, but turn out is good. So the the text come to uh, two see. important two important word so-called zheng and the qi. And I think I explained last week, when last week we talked about the use zheng, okay, which is norm, expected to govern the state. Use qi or ji, which is oddity or unexpected in the military, expectation, uh, military operation. So here, uh, the, the text use these two words again. Basis talk about Fortune can become misfortune. Misfortune can become fortune. Here also talk about the, the, the expected can become unexpected. Unexpected also can be expected. So, and then it leads to something good could become evil. So actually it's, you know, sometimes you get opposite result, right? You think something is fortune, turn out it's misfortune. Something is misfortune, is fortunate. Something is expected, but turn out it's unexpected. Something is unexpected, turn out it's expected. And something you think is good, but turn out is evil, okay, or bad. So what should I do? He said people are confused for a long time. So end it, talk about the sage, which is model, right? Talk about square, okay, you will see square and the cutting, right? So you can consider this one as a metaphor, right? It's somebody square. I will assume it means very principled, okay? But not like you have a corner, right? So you kind of like not so critical, even yourself is a principled person. If you are irreproachable or incorruptible, usually you are clean, Mr. Clean, Mrs. Clean. But you are not become too clean and turn out <clears throat> become a holding so high moral standard and become unforgiving, right? So I think that's also important. You are straightforward, okay, but you are not go unbridled, kind of go wild. So finally, he used a very uh, uh, common uh, phenomena to explain the situation like you are bright but not brazen, okay? So the last line, guang er bu yao, bright yet not brazen, basically put the essence on that. Your behavior is bright, but you never brazen. I think that's the uh, teaching on this one. So this one a little bit different than other uh, 
text, but it's kind of like start from the government politics, but eventually talk about how do you behave. I think that's the uh, my understanding of this chapter. So uh, among you have something to yeah, say. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, the, this is right on the coattails of 57 that talks about governing a state. That's the entire message of the previous chapter is how do you do this? And here it's being reiterated that doing it with a pell-mell agenda is a recipe for unexpected or an unanticipated consequences. And I think we talked about that a little bit. Um, I can't remember if it was last week or the week before, but the three strikes outlaw was one example of talking about you have a good principle or idea, but how it actually plays out in action doesn't serve the cause that you're looking for. And that's what this chapter is really talking about, that you may have an agenda, but if you're not careful or if you strive too hard towards it, you're going to reap a lot of unintended consequences. And that when things are quote unquote bad, that does not equal that they will indefinitely be bad. The thing that looks so bad at the moment could, in fact, be a real big boom. Probably the best example I could give of this in the contemporary sense, and it's the worst of the worst, would be World War II. A terrible thing. Worldwide, inarguably, an atrocity on top of an atrocity on top of an atrocity. But what did we get for it? We got the space race. We got a thriving economy in the U.S. We got a sense of unity of people. One of my old professors used to argue there were no Americans before World War II. You were an Irishman living in America. You were of English descent. You were Dutch. You were etc. What World War II created was an American identity. And so these things that seem misfortunate or these things that seem to be evil can become something else change is the one constant so how do you go about navigating that you get pulled uncarved simple stay to your true nature and make your true nature be one of silence simplicity principles and, you know, direct, but not immutable, not inflexible. Um, you have to be able to see sort of the ebb and flow of life and take a, all right, this is now, we'll see what's next kind of at approach and attitude towards it. That's its recipe for good governance. Um, we can agree or disagree with it, but that is very much what the Dao Te Ching is teaching is don't become recalcitrant. That will be a recipe for your own folly and probably for the folly of your people and will most likely just give you a huge amount of backlash. You're muted, Jason. Okay, thank you, Amon. <clears throat> so <clears throat> right now we can discuss about uh, this chapter 58. Uh, if you have a question or you have a comment, uh, please, you know, uh, please focus on this chapter. Uh, Kwang, please. Okay, sorry for the delay to activate my micro. Uh, so I want to say that this uh, stanza, what is interesting in the translation by Professor Roberts is precisely the question at the center of the poem. Who can find the turning point? So, and who can find the turning point? Because for it, there's no standard rule, okay? Finding the turning point, there's no standard rule. 
And the standard rule will make you think about the mind mechanism in the sense that when you find a role, whatever role, it is a production of the mind. And uh, it, that production of the mind can be good for 200 BCE, it can be good for 1050 CE, but maybe in 1800 CE, you would have to find another rules in 2024 CE would be another room compared to 2024 BCE. Uh, so for a time of long duration, this is why the wise who roll keep to the square, but form no edge, okay? I, I find this translation incredible. Keep to the square, but form no edge. In the sense that it reminds a little bit my discussion with Jason last week, okay? When I said that for ruling the Chinese empire, I am not against Taoism, but sometimes you need to add some Confucianism, some rules, okay? And here, that line is just perfect. Keep to the square, but form no edge. I am for Confucianism, but I am for that kind of Confucianism, meaning that you need some boundary, so you keep to the square, but form no edge in the sense that that Confucianism is a flexible one, a Confucianism that is capable to take into account the present reality and to remember that uh, why the wise who rule keep to the square but form no edge. And once again, one of the uh, why China is now at year 4722. I don't know what Jason would say to that, but it's because. It's a dance between Confucianism, Taoism, and legalism, which make that uh, we can have, we can keep to the square, but for no edge. I stop here for now. Yeah, thank you, Kwam. Um, uh, I have no, I, I think that uh, who can know the turning point, okay? And uh, the form the square, but no edge, okay? Uh, I think that, Bring up the, the essence. I have no objection on that, but unfortunately, the the text said, "Su zi qi ji." Okay, ji means the ending. So, uh, I as a translator, I have to bring this word. That's why I have to call it. Uh, which way it goes? Because the words say ji. Okay, not turning or fan or zuan. So uh, even I agree, but I can't, okay? And the second thing, <clears throat> uh, I also agree on the square, but no edge, but the text said ge, okay, which means cutting, okay? So of course you can say sharp corner is sharpening, cutting, whatever, but anyway, that's why I translate uh, cutting. So that's the, uh, the limit, I can say the limit I impose I to myself. Even I think this way, but I cannot go this way because the text say this way. So that's, yes, the, uh, uh, that's the thing I need. I need to say sometimes I <laughs> I wish I, <laughs> I can be more free. So. Uh, Jason, I agree with you. But sometimes in philosophical lessons and in poetic lessons, it is always permissible to see the irony under the line. And when you say that there is an irony under the line, it is always permissible to transgress the first meaning of the line. Of course, it is debatable. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, but, I, I decide to stick with this principle because I will yes. have the reader to decide. Okay. Yes, uh, exactly. That, that, that means, and you are the reader, you can decide, but I'm not the reader, I cannot decide. That's the problem. <laughs> On that, I agree 100% with you, in the sense that as a translator, you have to be as faithful as possible to the original words. I yeah, This yeah. one, I agree with you a trillion times. Uh, Madeline, please. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Amon. It's always such a pleasure to be here and learn from the translation and the translation process. Um, so I got a, a couple of mental images um, that had to do with this, um, in particular, keep to the square but form no edge. 
Um, so I was reminded of those um, things that were around in the 90s. It was called Artificial Life or A Life. And it would be a screen, let's say, full of black pixels with some white pixels scattered around. And one simple rule that was fed into the system um, might eventually, as the white pixels would move around, they might eventually form a square. But they wouldn't do it because of a rule that said, get inside this particular boundary. It had to do with uh, relational and how they related to each other. And around the same time, <clears throat> um, it was thought at least, I don't know if advances have been made since then, but um, the mystery of um, bird flocking, uh, and I believe also fish schooling, um, got resolved, which was how? How are these sort of complex swirling flocks of birds, how do they stay together but are constantly moving? And it turned out there was basically a very simple rule. If you were a bird, you want to get away from the edge because there you could be picked off by a predator and into the center. But you don't want to be too close to other birds because your wings are going to knock into each other and you won't have the right kind of airflow. So as soon as you're in the center and everyone else is crowding in, you want to start moving outward. And so that accounts for that swirling that nonetheless keeps an external shape. They're not following the rule that says keep to this external shape. They're just doing it because they're following something much simpler. And so I think to me that sounds like what this um, what this verse is about. Thank you, Mandarin, for sharing. Uh, I we have a uh, uh, I think Paul, right, please. Yeah, I love Madeline's comment about that this whole verse seems to have so much spatial reference. It's almost feels different than other verses in that regard. And I, I um, by the way, I just learned about why penguins circle the way they do and how they're huddling for warmth through their circling. But just just a point. But um, uh, what I really wanted to say was about the the idea of these polarities that we see all the time in lots of writing, you know, the black and the white, the, the yin and the yang. I'm not, no, I know that's not yin and yang, but the, I'm concentrating on fortune and misfortune, but put in this geometric spatial relationship. So fortune leans on, Was this was your translation, right, Jason? Fortune leans on misfortune and misfortune hides under fortune yeah. Yeah. but that's like a that's like such a fascinating description of a polarity because the fortune is dependent on the misfortune to stay up and the misfortune is dependent on the fortune to stay hidden mm -hmm. i just my mind is is moving with that and i want to know if if you uh see interesting aspects of that as well but that's my comment yeah, thank you, uh, Paul. You pick up the very good uh, 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 phrase here. Okay, so this this sentence in Chinese read, "Huo xi fu zhi suo yi, fu xi huo zhi suo fu." Okay, this one is a kind of common saying saying in Chinese, uh, even modern language. Okay, so basically you can serve as warning, right? If you uh, get a good job, okay. Uh, get a promotion, don't over excited. Okay, if we got day off, don't get depressed because you may open up a new opportunity. So that's become a kind of the end. In general, I really like this uh, chapter, is the very last line. Okay, and I think everybody translates basically the same way bright, but not uh, bright yet not brazen, right? So you want to do something good, but you don't want to do too good, okay, to the point hurting other people and then you may hurt yourself. So, you know, you I, I like the idea when you do the business, you want to be clean, but you don't want too clean. If you are 100% Mr. Clean, 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 you turn out that nothing work and the people hate you. Okay, a little bit blur. Actually, that's what I learned, you know, so. 
just my my own uh yeah I will have amount and the quant sorry yeah thank you <clears throat> and sorry for the delay as well I'm delayed this morning or this evening um there were so many things that came up but what Paul was saying about uh sort of the spatial reference that you get in the Chinese here. That's actually not an unusual sort of uh, turn of phrase, if I could call it that, in the Chinese vernacular. Um, my favorite example of this is zoyo, which literally just means left, right, but is used to me to say almost when you are talking about something is almost it's left right you know a little this way a little that way and that sort of metaphor is built into a pictographic language it's something that is much more sort of steeped in the way the language evolves than we have in sort of an alphabetic phonetic language in the western world <clears throat> excuse me the other thing I wanted to mention, because I couldn't let it go by, uh, Joe, choosing to uh, you read Derek Lynn's translation. Lynn is probably one of the translators I have the deepest respect for. His attempt to maintain fealty to the text is it's second to none. I mean, I think Jason and I are doing something very similar but when it comes to someone that i would point students or somebody to to say where's a good translation and get out of the doubt teaching derrick's is an excellent one to pick um if you're looking for something you know translated less interpreted if you're looking for something with a lot of interpretation that may get the sentiment across clearer there are other translators I might point to as well. I love Red Pine. As I said before, I love Stephen Mitchell. They're not literalists, but they are uh, good interpreters. Um, yeah, those were the couple of things I had to get off my chest. Thank you, Amon. Uh, Kwong, please. Okay. Uh, I would like to come back to what Pon said about the yin and the yang for the polarities and the, or the couples darkness and light and so on. But I would like to show again, okay, the Tai Chi Tu, meaning the diagram of the supreme ultimate, which shows the yin and the yang precisely. I, I know that all of us are also the uh, fundamentalists from Amon, and all of us know that, but sometimes we often forget in our mind that in the black fish, you have a small white dot, and in the white fish, you have a small black dot, okay? And I think that is precisely the yin and the yang, of course, would bring to mind first the male and female polarity, darkness and light and etc. But the other way to approach the yin yang is also the waxing and the waning process, okay? Uh, rising and decreasing, decreasing and rising. So uh, the, the Tao or the Tao Te Ching is probably one of the most complex uh, intellectual apparatus on earth, if not the most in complex intellectual and psychological apparatus on earth to make you understand a very simple principle, but it's not everyone that would be capable to take it like that. And that very simple principles is don't worry, be happy. Okay, but uh, it's not everyone is capable to take it in his heart like that, okay? So you have to go through stuff like the Tao Te Ching to get to that basic understanding. Don't worry, be happy. I stop here. Thank you, Kwong. Uh, Mark, please. Thanks. I was wondering about the notion about the future and the prediction, the expectation of future, oh. the, the awareness of the future. And something started tugging in my mind about the I Ching, that it's sometimes, I don't know if this is correct, understood as 
talking about ways of predicting the future. Uh, what is it called when you throw the bones? There's reading oracle bones, throwing coins, or yarrow sticks. Right. So that's what I was wondering about, the Tao Te Ching's relationship to that. Uh, okay, so uh, I uh, I think that's uh, thank you for bringing up this one. So I I think uh, fir first thing I need to respond is when I use expectation and unexpected expect expect and unexpected, I am not talking about predicting the future. I'm talking about, for example, my boss tell me, Jason, you did a good job. I expect expect have a race okay when i talk to uh let's say when i want to invite a girl out and uh, then she turn her eyes and i think expect get a rejection okay that's kind of expected i hope probably you can help me pick the right word will not bring to this kind of prediction future okay thing so that's why I put the printers is norm and oddity because when we govern, let's say th th these words are very zheng and qi. Okay, that's the two words. I sometimes translate as norm and oddity. Sometimes very political, right? So if you think about if you are a governor, you you want your people behavior or everything or economist, you want something under your expectation. But when you do the military operation, you want you don't want your uh, plan is expected by your enemy. So you want to have unexpected. So in this sense, I use expected and unexpected. I hope does it lead to the prediction or predict the future. And that, that's the thing. Probably I should use a different word. Is anybody know the the the, the, the right word and I were ready to uh, have it say okay and the second thing is about how does this one related to Yi Jing that's a many 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 interpretation um how does it re related to Yi Jing uh my own opinion which I believe not all people agree and then probably more disagree than agree about my opinion. I do not see the, you just put it this way, Yi Jing Book of Changes is, we can consider the oldest, oldest philosophical book, if you want to do that. So people know that, all the authors probably have an idea. Does that try to connect together? I don't know. I My assumption would be Book of Change is un, running on the background, just like I said, when fish write in a book of describe the world, the fish will not talk about water because it's in the water in this sense, I think. And another deeper question, what is Yi Jing itself? Also a big question because Confucius put a lot of notation on that and we don't know what's original on that. They have a lot of discussion, okay, we, we, we do. so. I do for me a big question mark on that. And as a translator, I try to remove all these kinds of things and that reader to decide how they relate it. Yeah. So I hope I answer your question, uh, Mark. Thank you for you know. I think your question always a challenge to me. <laughs> uh, Kwan, please. <laughs> Okay, I would like to complement a little bit that you answered, Jason, about the Di Qing. Because uh, I agree with you that the Di Qing is probably the oldest philosophy uh, in the world. Maybe not because you have Sumer and Mesotope, the Egyptians too, who were there and who wrote stuff in 3000 BCE. So they were older than the Chinese. But let's say that it's one of the oldest philosophy on the planet. Uh, the I Ching first, uh, is not the original document, okay? The original document is the Zhou Yi, and in that, uh, meaning the change of the Zhou dynasty. And in that change of the Zhou dynasty, the core text is very elementary. And it was only on the second half of 
uh, wow, well, uh, once again, the Zhou Dynasty began in 1046 BCE and it ended in 256 BCE. And there is a division from the Western Zhou and Eastern Zhou in 770 BCE. The Zhou Yi did not have the philosophical apparatus that accompanied the I Ching. According to tradition, uh, there, according to tradition, King Wen of the Zhou Dynasty, meaning at the very beginning in 1050 BCE, gave a beginning of philosophy, but I could, and it's possible, okay? I don't reject tradition, but if we want to stick to the text and to the archeological discoveries, what is the philosophical appendix of the Yi Qing, which is called the Su Yi, the 10 wings, according to the present day uh, archeological and philo philological discoveries, the first text of the Su Yi has been written in the 6th century BCE, right? And once again, Confucius was born in 551 BCE and he died in 479 BCE. So, of course, maybe it's my wishful, wishful thinking, but according to tradition, these 10 wings have been written in entirety by Confucius. And so if uh, not the 10 texts, not the 10 documents of the Su Yi, that's why it's called Su Yi, the 10 wings, not the entirety of the 10 wings have been this, uh, written by Confucius, but if the, the four major pieces have been written by Confucius, at least there is a correlation in the, in the dates, okay, since the uh, according to what we know now, spun to the time period of Confucius' life. I say a lot of things just to say that the Zhou Yi was the primitive document as a system of divination. And what we call the Yi Qing is the Bronze Age document, meaning 10, uh, 50 BCE, to which it has been added the Shi Yi, which is the philosophical uh, development from that primitive uh, text of divination. And it's only from there with the Su Yi that the Zhou Yi is called the Yi Qing, okay? The classic of change. Because the classic of change has epistemological and ontological pretensions. It's not only a a tool of divination, but is a representation of the world with ontological and epistemological development. But I stop here because if not, I will keep on making a presentation on the Yi Ching, maybe for the future. I stop here. Uh, thank you, Kwan. Uh, uh, Amam, please. Yeah, I, I appreciate Kwan's uh, <laughs> elaboration. Uh, section or something like yeah, <laughs> I appreciate the elaboration, but I do feel like... Um, I want to back up the conversation just a little because I know there are people here who are probably wondering, what is all this talk about the I Ching? What, what is this and where does it come from? So I pulled out the book. You guys can have a close look. These are the hexagrams of the I Ching. Those hexagrams were a development from old oracle divination techniques. The classic way that this was done was you heated a bronze rod and you shoved it into a ox scapula or the shell of a tortoise. And when you did, that shell or bone would crack. And reading the cracks, whether they formed continuously or whether they formed in broken segments, was how this idea of solid and broken lines developed. That's the inception point of yin and yang. And it was used to make predictions. And we know that because the people who would make the predictions would write them on the bone or the shell, crack it, read it, and then they'd record results. It was really kind of nice to sort of get this best out of 10 result. Should we, uh, will the queen have a auspicious birth and then you can read it nope it was a girl i'm not making that up that literally is one of the bones um so these oracle bones lead to the development of 
the Qing, which becomes this formalized document. This is as pan-Asian as pan-Asian can be. But the absolute quintessence of it is this idea of transformation. One thing becomes another. Every Chinese thinker takes that conceit on board and then has to address it in some way. So whether we're talking about the art of war or Confucianism or Taoism, they each recognize this as a universal that change is inevitable. How they'll address it are their own differing strategies. The Dao De Ching in this chapter very clearly is giving a strategy for dealing with that semi the expectation of the unexpected. The fact that we can know that the, there is going to be change. There may be some predictability or pattern or tendency within that change, much like we're getting into spring and we'll probably have fall in another six months just because that tends to be how it works out. But the particulars, those are beyond the prediction of even the greatest, you know, um, calculators. We can know that it's going to be fall in six months. We can't know if it's going to rain exactly this day, six months from now to the T. Contending with that, know the general pattern. K keep yourself harmonized and well aligned and square to that general pattern. But don't get hung up on getting down to the nitty gritty detailed edges, the cutting edge of, all right, what's going to be on the cusp? Because you don't have access to that information, A. And B, you can't possibly account for every unforeseen consequence of what you intend to do. So be responsive, be humble, and be attentive to those changes and flow with it. Thank you, Abam. Uh, so any, I'll, we go to the next one. Before that, okay, just show everybody what is Ichi, that's the book. I have a uh, wall. It's a when I was teenager, I bought this one, and it's been with me uh, so far. So <laughs> that means I understand every single word. But basically, <laughs> I have it for a long time. So, uh, Nick, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, please. Clear. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I I I lost track how we got to to this uh, book of change, but uh, um, just a question: um, Do you think that the the fundamental idea embedded in the book of change, the dualism, that has such a strong hold on Chinese thinking, that um, the Chinese philosophical tradition never developed anything in opposition to it in the sense of uh, notion of monism. Uh, uh, so therefore, it has continued for 2000 years, the dualistic view, and which, uh, you know, this uh, this uh, Tao Te Ching verse captured, uh, you know, the, 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 the dependence of fortune and misfortune uh, between mm -hmm each other, yin and yang. So do you think that's the case or, or is that too, too, too extreme uh, characterization? Can I, can I tackle this one real quick, yeah, Jason? Yeah, um, yeah. I, Nick, you have a really good point. Uh, yeah, this, do, this tradition seems much more um, cemented into the culture of Chinese culture and Asian culture writ large as a result, then some of the same sort of conceptual underpinnings have in other philosophical traditions. Probably the nearest one I draw a parallel with in the West is the idea of a spirit or some sort of non-corporeal self. Almost every tradition and almost every thinker 
treats that as rote until you get into the modern era and then you get thinkers who really kind of push back about that um there were those thinkers in ancient china that uh, the name escapes me right now but one of my favorite ones was a, a root scholar who really um went against the grain of a lot of things one of the uh examples he used was when why why does everyone claim there are ghosts and why do ghosts always have clothes shouldn't ghosts uh be naked but then does that mean clothing also creates ghosts and if that's the case how come we don't see garments floating all over the place in the entire world he was a absolute naysayer to sort of the chinese norm but i've mentioned this before the epistemological foundation in China is predicated on tradition in a way that it was not in the West. The Western culture had this essentialist pursuit. China validated its knowledge on the basis of tradition. And because of that, it made it much harder to sort of slough off this dualistic um, presupposition. It did happen though with the communist revolution there was a wholesale rejection of all things Chinese. Mao wanted to do away with all the four olds and many other things. But it was so entrenched in the culture that even post-communist revolution, it still creeps back in. It's still there. Much like even after the full-throated atheist began speaking out against the idea of an immortal soul or spirit, you still even with people who claim to be atheists will say, well, yeah, I believe in, you know, spirit or spirituality or my soul or some other absolute eternal corporal component of the person. That's sort of the compare and contrast I give. Okay. I, I, I need, to, thank you. Thank you, Amon. I think I need to, uh, we need to move on, you know, because this, uh, uh, dualism, moism question is, too big to discuss, I think. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Kwang, you have a hands up. Uh, can you, uh, if you have uh, something with, uh, related to Moism, Dualism, I think we should postpone to the later part of the discussion. That's focus. Uh, on this text. I, I, I would, uh, the, the guy that I mean was thinking to was Wang Chong. Uh, that's Wang Chong, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. You are and right. uh, that's a small detail. But the other thing is that I, I will take 30 seconds, okay? Because I, I'm aware that that subject will take three days, but I will take 30 seconds. Three so years, probably. I would like to remind everyone that the word E in I Ching means change, but it also means unchange, okay? So it's the book of changes and it's the book of the unchange. And I would like to remind that the character is made by the sun and by a simplified representation of the rain. So what changed that you have the duality between the sunny day and the rainy day? That's a symbol for everything that is dual, of course. But you have also the representation of what doesn't change, okay? The background that doesn't change. So I don't think that China is, uh, has a dualistic philosophy. China has a whole philosophy taking into account the dualism in becoming and the oneness in being. And I would like to say that if people read the Tao Te Ching and is not capable to see that the whole book is about the one, I am a little bit disappointed, but I stop here for now. Okay, thank you, Kwong, uh, for your opinion. And I probably would not see it's one. That's fast. <laughs> Sorry, Annette. So uh, uh, let's move on to uh, uh, 59. Okay. Okay. So same format. Okay. Uh, long living, uh, 59. Anybody want to read your uh, translation, please? Uh, Kwang, please. Okay, so translation by Professor Moss Roberts, stanza 59. 
for ruling man, for serving heaven. Nothing surpasses having in store, for it is having in store that we call taking precaution. And taking precaution, we call bend on amassing one's powers. Bend on amassing one's powers means overcoming all obstacles. Overcoming all obstacles means having no known turning point. Having no known turning point gives dominion over the kingdom. The mother source of this dominion yields staying power, what is known as deep roots and strong base, the way of extended life and sustained reflection. Thank you, Kwang. I, I, I'm sorry for the detail because I'm thinking okay, the translation. Okay. <laughs> I'm digesting. Okay. Uh, 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 Penny, please. Okay, I'm going to read Jia Fu Feng. In caring for others and serving heaven, there is nothing like using restraint. Restraint begins with giving up one's own ideas. This depends on virtue gathered in the past. If there is a good store of virtue, then nothing is impossible. If nothing is impossible, then there are no limits. If a man knows no limits, then he is fit to be a ruler. The mother principle of ruling holds good for a long time. This is called having deep roots and a firm foundation, the Tao of long life and eternal vision. So can you, uh, Penny, can you repeat the very first line? In caring for others and serving heaven. There is nothing like what? There is nothing like using restraint. Restraint. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paul, please. Since uh, Stephen Mitchell was mentioned, I'll, <laughs> I'll do him. Uh, <clears throat> for governing a country well, there is nothing better than moderation. The mark of a moderate man is freedom from his own ideas. Tolerant like the sky, all pervading like sunlight. sunlight, firm like a mountain, supple like a tree in the wind. He has no destination in view and makes use of anything life happens to bring his way. Nothing is impossible for him because he has let go. He can care for the people's welfare as a mother cares for her child. So, uh, Stephen Mitchell? Okay, sorry, I, I cannot follow with the original text. I, I agree because I, I didn't see much relationship from what was read previously. <laughs> I, 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 that's his. Uh, I, 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 I want to agree of, with uh, something. What? I want to agree with that because I know, Aman, you said that you sometimes like Stephen Mitchell, but I've studied his translation of the Epic of Gilgamesh quite extensively. And it's really, he adds so much to his his thoughts on it that you're not even reading the same text. <laughs> well, anyway, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Thank you anyway. I, it, it's good to, to hear how people do it. And a lot of time, uh, this kind of translation bring a different angle. Okay, basically he is talking about what he learned from this text. I think. Okay, so it's nothing wrong on that. Yeah, uh, can I say one more thing, which is Sri Kant used often reads Ursula Le Guin. I feel the same way about her, really, <laughs> Ursula Le Guin. But you know, it's either allowed or it's not. But there you go. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. How to pronounce your man, name? That's uh, Nalini. That's Nalini. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hi. I'm going to read it from Stefan Stenwood. 
and his translation does resemble some of the translations we heard earlier. <clears throat> when leading people and, <clears throat> I'm sorry, when leading people and serving heaven, nothing exceeds moderation. Truly moderation means prevention. Prevention means achieving much virtue. When much virtue is achieved, nothing is not overcome. Nothing not overcome means nobody knows the limits. When nobody knows the limits, one can rule the country. The one who rules like the mother lasts long. This is called deep roots and a solid base. The way to long life and clarity. Thank you. Uh, any other version? Sounds like we read a very different version. Um, <laughs> different <laughs> version. Okay, so uh, uh, if no more hand and uh, uh, Among and I are going to share our work on this. 59, Among, please. <laughs> Sorry, bear with me. It just went into full screen mode. I had to change out. Ah, chapter 59, long living. Governing people and serving heaven is nothing like persevering. Only persevering can be called early preparation. Early preparation is called reaccumulating the. Reaccumulating the leads to invincibility. Invincibility leads to inestimability. Inestimability leads to the capability of having a state, having ruling the mother root of a state leads to long li living. This is the Tao of deep roots. Long roots. <laughs> Firm foundation and long living governing for a long time. Uh, among, I think the word here is preserving, not persevering. Right? Oh, my mistake. Yeah. So um, the reason I point out this one, I think that's important, is uh, I find out uh, my among and I the translate this one probably different than most of other translation. Okay, because this one I take as a political teaching. When this one talk about long living, is not talking about uh, long living of your life, extend your life, longevity. It's talking about long governing. Okay, you can govern in a state for a long time. All your state can stay alive for a long time. I, I think that's what it means. The reason is when the text starts, Talk about governing people and the serving heaven. Okay. Only the prince uh, or the uh, the ruler serve heaven. Uh, people okay, don't serve heaven. So when you start with this one, you are talking about uh, the job of uh, ruler. You govern the people serving the heaven. So that's why I think this set the tone about politics how to rule. Second, I'd like to see this word, okay, I think pronounced as S, I I think. Uh, uh, a lot, I, I didn't hear people translate as uh, fugality. I do see a lot of English translation translate as a fugality. Uh, some, uh, I see restraint, moderation, okay. And then I think this word S actually means storage. Okay, in Chinese, the, uh, uh, today's word called lin si means small st storage, means you are stingy, okay, uh, too much, too frugal, okay, on that. So this word itself means storage. So I think that means when you govern it, most important is preserve something, preserving something, okay. It's just like the, the word means the storehouse, okay? When you put the grain inside, that's a storehouse. So nothing like preserving. 
I think that's preserve the resources. So then everything will make sense because preserving will lead to early preparation. I'm not sure other translation, but I think zhao fu means early trans uh, uh, early preparation. And the early preparation is zhong ji, zhong ji de means double, reaccumulating de, okay. And some translators are power, that's correct. But since uh, uh, our translation decide to keep the origin word called de, okay. So continue, reaccumulating de leads to wu bu ke, that means invincible, invincibility. Then wu bu ke, invincibility will lead to mo zi qi ji. That's a very interesting word. You don't know what's your limit. Okay, so if you have to translate the word by word is invincibility, invincibility lead to don't know your limit. Okay, so I think that mean, means, doesn't mean you are go wild, you don't do whatever you want to do. It means you have unlimited potential. So with all this, you, all this power, you see from the preserving, you can be early preparation, you have enough, accumulate enough the which is power and become invincibility, then you have unlimited potential. In this case, you can, your guo, okay, again, having a state, that means you can ruin a state. So, your guo zi mu, so I cannot say, oh, you are like mother, because your guo zi mu, it means the root or the uh, the 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 ruling the basic principle or the uh, mother may basic means the foundation so you can lead to long living so if you going from the very first line to this it all talking about governing so long living must means the long living of a state so this one is the Tao of deep root firm foundation long living governing for a long time. It, it's a lot of redundant, but uh, the text itself is in this way. And then one translation I find out uh, problematic in many English translation is this word, uh, a lot of I translate as, I don't know what other text translate. Is Josu doesn't mean long watching, seeing for a long time, but in Taoism text, si, okay, seeing means watching, means governing. Okay, I'm very sure on that. So uh, so that means Chang Sheng Josu, not because you are looking, thinking for a long time, it's because you are watching or ruling for a long time. Uh, because the si means watching. That's very Taoism uh, governing. You watch. That's it. Do nothing. Okay. So, uh, Amar, please. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. And <clears throat> I have to say, I really appreciate the choice to retain the in this chapter more than any because it's one thing that almost every other translation I've ever read just tries to find a good English approximation. But remembering that the is the quintessence of what these chapters are about from, you know, where we've begun way back at, you know, 38 all the way up to 81. That's the the, and then the Tao will come one through 37. Um, it really sort of illuminates what, is being talked about here, your personal emul emanating character, that personal virtue, but reaccumulating the or trying to build a capacity of the. What does that look like? The best answer I can kind of think of, of for this, and God, I sound like a patriot today for some 
reason. But the idea that the United States is still the country most the world wants to migrate to. There are people who come from all over the world, and it is because of the character that is the United States that's in their mind, the land of the free, a land of opportunity, the streets of gold, blah, blah, whatever all of that has been. That has been centuries, yes, of propaganda, also centuries of developing a character that, you know, begrudgingly said, come on in, you can, you know, find a place here somewhere. And I emphasize the begrudging. Um, but that would be the duh of a nation, the virtue of a nation, how you could look at a kingdom or a nation and say, what is its character? What is its, what, what do we, what is it broadcast to the world at large? Um, the inverse of that might be the North Korea example, which I'm sure many people have very specific in, imaginary uh, visions of, but not a lot of immigration is trying to go there. So here, what the chapter is telling the ruler, build that the, build that virtue, build that character that is your country's character, your nation's character, not artificially, not Machiavellian propaganda. Be sincere to what the actual character of your nation is because your nation is just the accumulation of all of your people and so get your people together get them united let their actual duh emanate and you will see a long-lived character if you allow it to be itself if you try and stamp an imprint on it that will not last. That is a character that will be a flash in the pan. Um, yeah, I, I do agree with Jason that this is a chapter very specifically written to the princeling. I did like the suggestion made in the comments about um, long reign, R-E-I-G-N, or an enduring reign. I do think that that would be viable for the long living governing. Um, but the other example that we were talking about is that uh, word si, which really does lend itself to preserving because it means something like stingy or parsimony. And so really be, you know, withholding of not just letting not just spending your good will and capital, goodwill capital all at once. Keep stingy about that. Keep, you know, um, building it up. That That's the best I can give for an interpretation or an explanation of this. But as far as translators go, yes, it's a spectrum of interpretation to translation where nobody's a hard one or a hard zero. We're all in the decimal points in between. Um, some of those translators are very far to one side of what you might legitimately call translating. And so no scho scholarly wise, their writing is not what should be examined. But sentiment wise, it was actually nice to hear because as you were reading the Stephen Mitchell, I was following along, and it's kind of nice to see, oh, from this he gets that, from this he gets that. And you can hear the influence, like I said, but you can also take that on board and say, okay, so how far and wide is that the interpretation that has been taken from it? Because as my old professor used to say, Zen Buddhism is really just Taoism and Buddhist drag. Thank you, Amam. Uh, we have a few hands up. Uh, we have uh, Kwang, Madeline, and uh, Yulia, please. Okay, first, I would like to say that uh, it is uh, 
safe to say that all the classical Chinese literature that has been produced, let's say, between 800 BCE. Why I choose 800 BCE? Because it was the year that we can be sure that we have the first uh, complete corpus of uh, the Yi Ching, okay? So that all that uh, classical Chinese literature, which has been produced between 800 BCE and 221 BCE, the creation of the first Chinese empire, was destined to the aristocrats, okay? It has been written by the aristocrats and the readers were the aristocrat for a very down to earth reason. The peasant didn't know how to read and write, okay? I don't need a very long explanation. I'm sure that there were some small exceptions, but 99% of the peasant didn't know how to write and to read, that's all. Some rich merchant at the time, and there were many of them, knew how to read and write for the usual operations of uh, commerce, but most of the time, those are not the kind that would go into strategic, governmental, or philosophical considerations. That's a generalization, but let's say that it's a generalization on which you can rely at 90%, let's say. So, and it makes me go into the interpretation of this stanza because this stanza is definitely about government. And I would like to offer the two interpretation of two aristocrats who live five centuries apart. The first one is Han Feizu, and Han Feizu was born, uh, or rather Han Feizu was born in 280 BCE and who died around 230 BCE, okay? And he was victim of the first emperor precisely. Uh, well, who was not yet the first emperor in 230 BCE, who would only be the first emperor nine years later in 221 BCE. That Han Feizer explained the word sir as conserving or garnering or gathering spiritual powers, okay? Because uh, here, if I go back to the translation, for ruling man, for serving heaven, nothing surpasses having in store, for it is having in store that we call taking precaution, right? So here, having in store or garnering in store or etc. is for me, and I, 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 I buy that interpretation, is garnering, gathering, conserving, increasing spiritual power, intellectual powers, emotional powers, the powers of a leader. So it means uh, amassing one's power, amassing one's powers means overcoming all obstacles. Overcoming all obstacles means having no known turning point. Having no known turning point gives dominion over the kingdom. The more the source of this dominion gives staying power, what is known as deep roots and strong base, the way of extended life and sustained reflection. Okay, those two last words, sustained reflections, meaning that you have to be precisely in that inner home in that capacity of awareness from which you will have a right reading of your mind and of your inferior emotions precisely. Because what is very central in the life of all ruler and even of small arist aristocrats, not necessarily, not necessarily being at the head of a principality or of the kingdom of the empire is to have self mastery. And if you don't have that capacity of inner awareness in the home to, re to uh, recall the marvelous uh, translation, I don't remember of what stanza, but I think it was stanza 52. Uh, anyway, it was between 50, 450 and 57, the inner home. And that inner home is one of the let motive, is one of the catchphrases of the Tao Te Ching, okay? Once again, it was written by aristocrat for aristocrats. And one of the things that they were uh, 
they receive as preaching, as lesson from their childhood is that you need to have an inner mastery. And in order to have that inner mastery, you have to reach to your inner home. And from that inner home, you would, be, you would have precisely the, the capacity to overcoming all obstacles means having no known turning point, okay? And that having no known turning points, it would give you dominion over the kingdom. But why you would have dominion over the kingdom? Because you have first dominion over your inner kingdom, okay? Your emotions, your inferior emotion, even your superior emotions, okay? Uh, because if you have a superior emotions that you would push you to help people, but if you are not stable in your understanding and you are not capable to, to see the situations, you would do things that would be inappropriate. And if you do things that is inappropriate because you were not capable to see the situation, well, uh, you will not be capable to have dominion over the kingdom because you did not have dominion over yourself first. I will take a last 30 seconds to say that there is a minor interpretation of that stanza from the, the copy of the Quotien uh, um, copy precisely. And from the copy of the Quotien, uh, the word Chu meaning to roam is uh, replaced by the word Chi meaning to provide. And here, if the word chu to Rome has been replaced by chi, meaning to provide, uh, you can maybe understand that here you have to interpret on a very down to earth meaning what you have in store, okay? And then rather than how to store your inner awareness to master your mind and yourself, you would have simply in store grains to provide to, for the peasants in case of a famine, for example. And surprisingly, the other aristocrat that I love a lot, Wang Pi, who was born in 246 and who, no, I love him, but I, I always mix up his uh, the, the, the dates, okay? He died in 249 and he was born 23 years before meaning he was born in 226 and he died in 249. He has a very short life. And very strangely, that Wang Pi, who most of the time gave an interpretation in terms of inner home of mind powers and of the ruling class, this time in this specific stanza, Wang Pi would go with the interpretation about storing grain and not storing inner power. So I just want to mention a case that my hero went astray. I finish here. Well, uh, 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 thank you, Kwang, to provide a different opinion. And it reminds me about the reading uh, Plato's uh, Republic, right? So some people read uh, 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 political writing. Some people read is inner and uh, then govern your soul. I think that <coughs> always <coughs> can have a different kind of uh, interpretation. And we just mark we have a different uh, way of reading. Uh, mother, Madeline, please, thank you. Yes, thanks, Jason. Uh, can you put your translation up on the screen again? Great, yeah. so, um, yep, that's fine. I am wondering about um, the word inestimable inestimability, um, what that means literally, because when I think of estimating, I think of- Okay, you mean the in, uh, what, inestimability, right? This word, right? Yes. Okay, the uh, Chinese word is this, mo zi qi dong know your limit, okay? Or don't know his limit, okay? His uh, end, okay? if you want to know what's the Chinese word. And I uh, hope that the inestimability, which sounds very odd, uh, reflect the meaning. Okay, so. Ah, uh, okay. So, um, <clears throat> so in the Chinese, it has the sense of extension, but in English it has, it can have the sense of extension, 
but it also can mean to estimate, like to guess at an amount or a quantity, which would certainly tie in with the kind, the thing of, you know, like crops and grains. Yeah, you can think, say this way. That's definitely nothing wrong to see this way. Okay, so uh, I I just make not I just have a hard time. Okay, the uh in to pick the right word. Okay, uh to reflect what's the Chinese word uh presented here. So uh, do I respond in the right way or do I answer the question or? Uh, oh, maybe? yes. Yes, that was fine. Okay. So, so if you, 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 I, I really appreciate if you give me like, oh, just like Mark said, uh, he, he, I use the expectation, expected, unexpected. He kind of did him to think about uh uh, 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 foretell the future. So I, I think something like this, it's very, important for me because uh you know it's very difficult if you choose one word it may uh mislead to another another word and i cannot make everything as the as ren as e as <laughs> and nobody wants to read it so <laughs> thanks yeah, so anyway uh i know it's a challenge but you know it's always been this way and again uh uh, 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 the same text have a different kind of uh, interpretation. I think for the ancient time, uh, ancient text is always the case. Case, okay, and the Plato's Republic is probably the uh, the 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 one of the example, right? So uh, people keep arguing, what does he talking about? Yeah, you uh, Yulia, please. Hey, I'm wondering if in your first line, you mean something like this. I'm going to paste in the chat where nothing is like preserving rather than is nothing like preserving. Okay, I do the thank you for talking about this. I, yeah. I when the translation, one thing difficult uh, uh, I try to do is try to catch the tone. Okay, but of course I don't know how ancient Chinese speak. So only thing I can do is from the text. So Chinese text say, okay, uh, governing serving the heaven, that's not a problem. Mo ru qiang. Okay, that's a very common uh using way. Nothing like, not mm. what if you read not like, okay, but it means nothing like, okay. I hope I do it right, but uh, that, 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 I, that that's... I'm asking because preserving it seems like a positive thing in the rest of the chapter. Like, like a, it, it, it's, it's a positive thing. Preserving, the, does this one sound positive or negative? I think it's positive. When, when you have is nothing like, then you're saying that governing people and serving heaven has nothing to do with preserving. Like preserving is the last thing that you would have when you're governing people. That's that's probably nothing heaven. then. Okay, probably that's the mistake. Uh, among Yeah, the, or maybe nothing other than. Or, uh, nothing um, other than. I think that. Or part, as I, I put it in here. Um, yeah, in yeah, 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 yeah. You are right. You are right. Nothing you are right. is Sorry. like. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Gotcha. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I let this go when we were working on this one, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> because the thrust of the argument is that preserving de is the greatest thing that someone could do, and so although it seems like a hard left turn that governing people and serving heaven is nothing like preserving, the previous chapters have been all about governing people serving heaven but then we're talking about preserving and how that informs the process of governing as we go on so it, reading it that way it didn't strike me as incorrect i do know what you're saying though about the idea that um you're making the comparison, nothing's like this, that this is as good as it can be. And so I think it can be read in both sort of interpretations, but there is a tendency in the Tao Te Ching to sort of give the negative uh, example. Yeah. 
And so that was one of the reasons why why I didn't flag this and say, no, this is grammatically incorrect. But I do think that you've got a strong point. And it could be that you could say it the other way and it would have a more uh, aspirational message or a more sort of here's what you should be striving to do. So I change it to is nothing other than preserving. Does the sound does does this clear much is clear? Actually, that makes it a little harder. <laughs> really? Okay. So okay, that's, so. that's take offline. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's that that's that's the difficult part because uh this text is very uh <laughs> uh okay, anyway. Okay, so let's move on. <laughs> David, please. Mm -hmm. so. Thank, thank you, Yulia. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate this kind of, uh, uh, sure. yeah, because it's, uh, uh, we only have one mic and plus uh, a mic, only two mic. We really need other people to to tell us how to use it. Because one word, people have a different uh, feeling. Even same people have a different feeling in a different day because something happened in the day. So, uh, David, please. Yeah, so so one comment and, and one question. So the, so the comment, as Madeline and I were discussing in the chat, and I see in uh, Arthur Whaley's translation, he says, for that equivalent to what you're calling inestimability, he says, if there is nothing it cannot overcome, it knows no bounds. And only what knows no bounds is huge enough to keep a whole kingdom in its grasp. So maybe no bounds might be, or trying to incorporate that, uh, and again, as Madeline expertly said, that it goes along with the square without cutting of no bounds, boundaries. So, so just, just. But my my question um, was actually related to that same translation, and by John Wu, uh, they mm -hmm. say for that comment where you say reaccumulation, he's saying double your garnered power and doubling one's garnered power. John Wu also says. Uh, uh, I think it was a du double the reserves of virtue. I mean, that's you know, you know reaccumulating the duh. Um, but interestingly, James Leggy from 1891 says repeated accumulation. So I was just curious about the choice of reaccumulation. So, so you're an expert translator for 1891, but it's <laughs> so, but. When you say this reaccumulation, and I was specifically curious because these two other translations say double, and I was wondering if numerologically, if numerology, there was something in Chinese about double, and yeah, that you chose cool. to say reaccumulation. So I was just curious about the, the, the factor of two that's used as doubling in the other one, and why you chose reaccumulation and not double. Uh, well, double means re, right? Because uh, uh no. So, so, okay, yeah, that means. <laughs> Again, right? So that's double. <laughs> At least that's my understanding. Okay. If uh, I, I'm not sure everybody agree with me or not, please let me know. Uh, the reason I changed Rui because this word, Chong, okay, that, that means double again. So am I right? That uh, translates as Rui. Rui means again, double. Well, yeah, but but again, I mean, I mean, not, not I, okay. The be pedantic, but I, mean, I, I was really curious if in the Chinese, because it says double, if there was any, either, especially at that point of time, if the if the factor of two, if the double, if that number, because I know in you know four is a bad number. I mean, I know all this numerology in Chinese. Um... So I was curious if the two had any special significance because they're saying double there as opposed to any other multiplicative 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 value. I, I don't believe in new, new numerology and I don't believe during that time they care about this, that like a four is a bad number, eight is a good number, six, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, this word specifically, zhong, okay, zhong, okay, means double, means, doesn't mean two times. In When I say double, well, when I use re, it means double, but it doesn't mean only two times. It means again and again. So let's put it this way. Okay. At least I my an understanding of chong. Okay. okay. Chinese say chong fu. Okay. That means 
you do it repeatedly, okay, re, okay. okay. So that's the word, okay. So uh, you can, it, 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 the answer should be, it's double, but it means it implied many times. Okay, so is that the right answer? <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank thank you for questioning this. Yeah, really appreciate. It. Yeah, uh, Mark, please. Thank you, Miss Paul. <laughs> thank you. So interesting hearing everybody contributing. Uh, I want to make two very small points and then ask a question. My first is, I really, you know, Jason, just five minutes ago, you said. Oh, I can't leave every word as Tao and dead. No one's going to want to read this translation. I completely disagree. And I really think that the kind of translation that you're doing and reading along with your translation, where you are leaving words untranslated and where you are indicating things in the notes makes your translation very special. And if I were just, let's say, turning to the Tao Te Ching for the first time, or I was interested in learning about it from any perspective, or even being well-schooled in it, I can't see how your translation would not be extremely helpful. So I really hope that you and Amon pursue the idea of trying to publish it. And my other comment was about um, what Madeline had asked about the translation of inestimable. And I know, Madeline, you mentioned that to estimate something is to, you know, try to guess how much it is or whatever, however you want to think about estimating. But inestimable also means in English that you cannot compare it to anything else with regard to goodness, in a sense. So your translation, your use of the word, I think, has a double meaning. You're, you're taking it in the sense, literally, that without limit means it, it can't be estimated. So it's inestimable, and it can't really be bounded in that sense. But then the English word inestimable also means extremely good, in a way. And anyway, my question is about the... Uh, the structure of this chapter. And I think one thing that every translation agrees on is that there's a kind of logical progression. Yeah. Here, which really reminds me of the great learning. You know, I think the third or fourth paragraph in the great learning mm -hmm. and, um, you know, when things are investigated, knowledge becomes complete and then knowledge be complete, the thoughts, are sincere and when thoughts are sincere the heart is rectified and so on so this really really stood out to me as something more rare in in the Tao Te Ching and something where it's kind of engaging it's saying you know we can think this way as well so is that your question uh I think yeah, you, it, you, it, you it, give it, a good it, answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you because this one is the very typical ancient Chinese logic, right? A did to B, B did to C, C did to D, D did to E. Therefore, blah, 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 blah. That's a thing. Of course, you if you examine by Aristotelian syllogism, they have a lot of problem here. Okay, because you don't know the relationships. Uh, sometimes, and then it uh, sounds like you are very familiar with great learning. Great learning to A to B, B to C, C to D, D to E. Then you go backward one more time, right? So you, you, in a way, it's re-emphasize the teaching. But in a way, if you want to examine the logic sense, it kind of like uh, it's a necessary condition or sufficient condition. It's, it's really, I, I think that's another subject, but uh, that's interesting because that's one part of interest about, of my interest about the how does ancient Chinese convince people. I think that's another way without uh, Aristotelian uh, syllogism, right? So how do we convince another people? So 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Mark, again. I did want to point out, Mark, that you're touching on the Chinese logic and their ability to use that logic for their purposes is something we see here and is repeated in the Zhuangzi. In fact, there's many a dialogue that is tying logical knots around another uh, opponent, if you will, to make the point that even this sort of deeply structured argument that is compelling isn't necessarily the best way of getting to knowledge. And I think if I remember, we saw it in the Analects and we may have even seen it in Sun Tzu. Yeah, I these texts really do speak to one another in a very real way. Okay, so uh, let's move on. Kwang uh, and uh, Penny, please. Uh, I would like to say that what uh, these the members of this distinguished group call the Chinese logic uh, has a common pattern that can be identified very easily if they were obsessed as me with the Ji Qing. In the sense that that kind of logic always either comes from the 10,000 things and go up to the unifying infinite awareness, or we start with the infinite awareness and we go down the six steps to the 10,000 things. And sometimes at a certain layer, for example, the layer two of the intellect, they would put some uh, uh, common sense uh, uh, reductio absurdum, okay? I give a very down-to-earth example coming from the Chuangzi. Okay, in the Chuangzi, I don't know, remember in what chapter, uh, it is said that, is it necessary to put the legs to a snake, okay? So it would take example from nature that a snake doesn't need legs because uh, the snake is an animal that would move without legs. But the fundamental, according to my obsession with the exagram and with the I Ching, the fundamental process of reasoning of the Chinese classical thinkers is precisely going from either, once again, I repeat, the 10,000 things and going up to the one, that is uh, paragraph 2.4 of the Analects, or starting with the one and going down to the 10,000 things, that is the twin brother, which is stanza 38 of the Tao Te Ching, okay? And sometimes, it doesn't start with six going to one or one to six. Sometimes it starts with four going to one. Sometimes it starts with two going to five. And if you look at that with the hexagram as the skeleton, it is quite easy to understand the, the Chinese way of reasoning, meaning from the less fundamental to the most fundamental or from the most fundamental to the less fundamental. And in certain reasoning, they will start with the most fundamental, the six, but sometimes in certain reasoning, they will start at what I call an average fundamental, meaning starting with five, starting with four, starting with three, rather than starting with six. And sometimes in the other direction, they will not always start with one, they will start with two, three, and going up. I stop here. Uh, thank you, Kwang. And we have uh, Penny and uh, Paul. Then we probably need to wrap up. Uh, okay, okay. So. I just had a, a a thought about this reaccumulating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> so here's here's my thought though. Like if I say reread, okay, it means I'm going to go read it again. But if I say like redo or repaint, it seems like there's something lacking. So the the process is to to make up for the lack. So reaccumulate in my mind, and I don't know if I'm reading it wrong, but almost sounds like somehow you lost it, there's some lacking. And so you have to reaccumulate, but I'm not sure if that's the sense no, you were- that, that's not, that is, that's not, that's not, thank you for pointing out that. Okay, so uh, what's your suggestion, uh, uh, Penny? I want to say it's, it's important, that means, 
Well, probably I should use double like David said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably I should use double accumulation like David said. If I use re, give some people at least to uh, give Penny this feeling. I <laughs> something so I, yeah, I, I, I try to uh, catch the most of the audience correct, right? right. So uh, if you as a modern literate reader say, uh, give me a feeling of lacking something. That means they have something wrong on that. So I have to go back to David said double. Okay, even I not that agree on that, but at least there's no a uh, uh, blur line on this. So uh, I, I I really appreciate you you share. How do you think? Yeah, because it's difficult. I have to say. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Paul, please. Yeah. Quick question that somewhat refers back to Aman's little explication of World War II and things like this and the values and the Chinese and Mao and but it's really more about it is right about the text it is about the text because I'm going to counter the idea of not translating the which I usually I love that you've done that but in this case we have to grapple with the question of what it means to accumulate the what it means to reaccumulate the and it's very difficult to do that without having some sense of what you're reaccumulating and to distinguish between the personal the and you've you've called this the rulers for a country the and i the thing that Aman hinted at i thought was um basically the idea that like in the in the united states the dem democratic values and the individual freedoms is sort of a duh. It's like a virtue of that was fought for that defined the culture that made us. And then when Mao tried to wipe out these things, the duh was really the teachings that go back to the I Ching. Or is it this book? The cult, what you're cultivating are the teachings in this book that to the whole country. But then you're bringing it down to the populace as opposed to being a very passive leader. So just some thoughts about what it means to accumulate duh as a leader. Uh, well, I think that that's a good, I think the uh, one translation, a lot of translation translated as uh, reaccumulate power, right? Okay, actually that's the right meaning for that, you know, but I just don't want to translate as power because I just want to repeat, I follow the great uh, Buddhism monk Xuan Zhang's idea of translation, uh, but he's doing different. He translates Sanskrit to Chinese. He said that the three things I will keep the original sound. First, if it's related to mysticism. Second, one word have the multiple meaning. Okay. Third, uh, if the 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 concept doesn't exist in the other country. Okay. Number four. If being traditionally translated in this way, I'm not going to change it. And the number five, something is respectable. Okay, it's too high a word like run. Okay, I don't want to translate as benevolence. It sounds too low. We want something high. We can worship. So, so if I run, so if you ask me, the why you want to translate? I think they have multiple meaning. Okay, so if I translate to power and the next time I have to transfer to virtue, next time, I have to, so they have uh, some problem on that. So then I have to put the print parentheses every time I have to put that. So that's caused another problem. So uh, that, that, that's the principle I'm doing. So but, but what is a leader being taught? I, I, I love your, your I, I agree with everything you said. What is a leader being taught? That's Can I tackle this question. one? Yeah, that's I tackle this one? Question. Yeah. That's the power. That's 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 the another another thing. You know, we can talk about later. But you know, the my job here, I just want to focus on the tech and then basics. That's your question. You find your answer, right? So yeah, I, I that's my job here. So when the text say pin, which means female sexual organ, I just translate to that. I'm not going to give you as yin yang or something like this. When they say say uh, 55, talk about baby penis. Okay, that's baby penis. I'm not going to say that means something, right? So you make your own intervention. A cigar is a cigar. Okay, that's the, the, the idea I'm doing. So I do, uh, 
I do uh, want to take a prerogative to jump in for the last couple of minutes before oh, I sorry, got to I'm run. Not, I forget no, no, no. I, 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 I appreciate the back and forth because I, it is it, part of what I heard in Paul is the uh, Western philosoph philosophical refrain: "Give me a definition, damn it!" And it, you don't get one. Um, you get example upon example, but the example of the is very elusive in terms of okay how do i cultivate what i naturally have the virtue that is me that is something the individual has to learn through a lot of trial and error and recognition of when you're violating your own self expectation at the same time how do you cultivate the duh of an institution an organization a a nation and that is a slower process that is a process that you in a position of power have some ability to steer by virtue of the decisions you make um give you the, the example of the NAACP that you may have feel any kind of way about them but their absolute dedication to standing by the principle of free speech means that they uh, advocate for both the most laudable and the most reprehensible versions of free speech. And so they have their square. We support this virtue, this power that our nation has. And they don't get down to the edges so much of is this you know repugnant or is this you know favorable favorable they understand that a line does exist no yelling fire in a crowded theater we've come to establish that nationwide as also part of that duh so it's not limitless although it is nearly boundless shy of that this is just one like concrete example I could give of where an institution and where an individual within an institution to decide to take a case or not take a case is participating in the redoubling, which was another word I offered there, as opposed to reestablishing or uh, in S redoubling. God, I can't think. Sorry, it's been a long day. Um, of redoubling the virtue of that kingdom of that nation um yeah i i think everyone here uh nalini asked earlier about a sort of crash course on Taoism. perhaps we could do that sometime in the future but you hear the sort of struggle with interpretate interpreting this text with us who are trying to examine it as as critically and as directly as possible that's existed throughout the history of Taoism um and so we could talk about it but I like to say you're going to get a different version of it by zip code it just changes with every new interpretation I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you for letting us do this again. It's always a privilege. I've had a great time. I'll listen in as long as I can. Uh, Paul, I thank you. Oh, thank right. you. Uh, folks, um, thank so you. Jason and uh, Amon will need to leave soon. Um, We're going to continue the discussion. Um, I'm going to continue the discussion with uh, with Quan of that we started last time on the different relationships between Christianity and Ch Chinese thought. Uh, Jason, did you want to say anything before you leave? Well, as usual, uh, thank you everyone. And then uh, especially everybody give me the feedback. Uh, 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 one thing I appreciate is point out, for example, today I really feel like I receive a lot of things. For example, the uh, chapter 59, uh, reaccumulation. I think that that's uh, problematic in a way. Okay, so if of course penny confused, that means that a good portion of people confused, right? And uh, Yulia talking about 
the oh and and the Yulia talking about nothing like or nothing other than yes that's that's also very important. So something like that, very important. And also appreciate Quan give a different opinion on that. Just like I said, when we read one thing, we have a different thing. And then I definitely don't want this one become my version. I want to have people's different version. And then uh, 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 we tell people how we think. Then there's no expert here, I think. So anyway, thank you. Uh, see you next week. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, 